In this video, we are going to compute the lattice of subfields for the field E, which is which for us in this video is going to be Q, the rational numbers adjoin the square root of 3 and the square root of 5. Now, notice that E is in fact the splitting field for the polynomial P of X, uh, which is X squared minus 3 and x squared minus 5. Now, of course, if we view this as a rational polynomial, we get that x squared minus 3 and x squared minus 5 are, in fact, irreducible polynomials. Um, they're quadratic, so we can, vary, we can check by the rational roots theorem. The only possible roots would be plus or minus 3 and plus or minus 5, respectively. That doesn't work. You could also use Eisenstein, Eisenstein's criteria to show, since 3 and 5 are prime numbers as integers, um, that this polynomial, these polynomials are irreducible. Okay, now of course P of X, if we think of it as a polynomial over E, um, then these polynomials actually factor. You're going to get X minus the square root of 3. You're going to get X plus the square root of 3. You'll get X minus the square root of 5. And then you're going to get X plus the square root of 5 like so. And so we see that this polynomial does in fact split over the presumed splitting field E in that situation. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what we're going to get here. We get four possible roots for this polynomial. We're going to get plus or minus the square root of three, and we're going to get plus or minus the square root of five. And so if you view these as complex numbers, right, um, uh, the complex field is in fact an algebraically closed field by the fundamental theorem of algebra. Um, so every, poly every rational polynomial will split inside of C. Um, and so oftentimes we go to the complex numbers to try to understand what the roots of these polynomials are. And so this polynomial P has four roots. There's the square root of three, negative square root of three, square root of five, and negative square root of five. And notice that um, our field E contains exactly those four elements, right? Because if you contain the square root of three, then you're going to contain negative square root of three. It's additive inverse. And if you have the square root of five, then you're going to contain the negative square root of five. So we see, in fact, that E is the splitting field for P because this is the minimal extension of where we adjoined roots of of p to q and we got this we didn't have to adjoin all four of the roots because as the roots come in these additive inverse pairs once you took one from each you get then you got the other and so i want to mention that because of the factorization of p right here into two irreducibles um, you'll notice that these two numbers here the square root of three and negative square root of three these are conjugates of each other because uh, they have the same minimal polynomial, because that's x squared minus 3. And likewise, plus or minus the square root of 5, these are likewise conjugates of each other, uh, because, again, they have the same minimal polynomial, x squared minus 5. Uh, so there, there is this relationship between the two. The, the two are very much close to each other in that regard. Uh, so to make conversation a little bit easier, we're going inter to introduce some other notation here. So we're going to introduce the field F1, and this is going to be the field Q adjoin the square root of 3. We're likewise going to introduce the field F2, which is going to be Q adjoin the square root of 5. And so I want to analyze these fields for a moment. So if you look at F1, um, there exists an automorphism, um, sigma, which goes from F1 to F1. Um, which be aware that F1 as a set, as a vector space, it looks like the span, which we're going to take rational coefficients here. Um, as there's lots of different fields in play, we might need to specify which vector space we're talking about. This is a Q span here. Um, this is going to be the span of elements of the form 1 plus the square root of 3. Uh, since the minimal polynomial of the square root of 3 is x squared minus 3, uh, we see that F1 is going to be a degree 2 field extension of Q. So F1 over Q, this is a degree two extension. It's a quadratic extension in that situation. Um, so coming back to sigma here, sigma is the map that is determined by the relationship. Um, so sigma will, sigma will take the element A plus B square root of three, and it maps it to A minus B times the square root of three. Now, in like a in a previous algebra class, like college algebra, intermediate algebra, so like math 1050, math 1010 at SUU, um, you would call this the conjugation map, right? You're replacing uh, the number a plus b square root of 3 with its conjugate, right? This notion of conjugate is trying to generalize that concept. We're replacing the number with its conjugate. Essentially, this is the map that sends the square root of 3 to the negative square root of 3. 
And so there is an automorphism there. I want us now to return to the field E. Um, we could actually represent the field E as F2 adjoin the square root of three. Because after all, um, F2 is Q adjoin the square root of five. So if you take the square root of five and then you adjoin the square root of three, that's exactly what the field E was to begin with. All right, so E uh, can be written as an extension of F2. Uh, so in particular, we have that F2 sits in between E and of course Q, like so. And you can accomplish this by joining the square root of three. Um, I want you to be aware that this map sigma, which we're viewing it as an F1 map automorphism, this can actually be extended to a map on E, okay? Because in that situation, um, if you think of it not as at this, if you think of E as a rational span, your basis is going to be four elements. But if you think of this as an F2 span, this is exactly the same thing. And so E over F2 is still going to be a quadratic extension. And we can do this exact same map as before, where now instead of thinking of A and B as um, rational numbers, we think of these as elements of F2. All right, and so sigma, we very much can think of this map from E to E. But with this perspective, note that, yes, yeah, sigma is going to send the square root of 3 to its conjugate, the square root of 3. But it's also, when you restrict it to F2, this just gives you the identity map on F2. So in particular, sigma, we can identify with a map inside of the Galois group E over F2. It fixes F2. So in particular, this is a subgroup of the Galois group of E over F, which of course is Q in this situation. So this map, which it fixes the square root of five, but conjugates the square root of three. So be aware that our map is looking something like the following. If we take an arbitrary element, we'll say that A plus B square root of five, like so, whoops. And then you have a C plus D square root of five times the square root of three. This map is going to send, it's going to leave, and so for each of these numbers, A, B, C, D, these are in fact rational numbers. Um, this map is going to send the first number, which belongs to F2, it's just going to leave it alone. And then with the second one, you're going to take the negation there, and so you get C plus D times the square root of 5 times the square root of 3. So that's what that thing ends up doing in that situation. All right, I want you to note that this map is order two, right? If we take sigma squared, um, you get back the identity. Uh, the identity on E, by the way. So this was the identity earlier on F2, uh, but if you do sigma squared, that leaves the identity on everything. Everything is left fixed in that situation um, if you do it twice. Now, if you do it only once though, because after all now we're very interested in what's the subgroup generated by sigma here, um, it'll contain just the identity in sigma. So as a group, this thing is isomorphic to the cyclic group of order two. Um, I'm interested in what is the fixed field associated to this, uh, this map sigma right here? Because notice when you look at this expansion right here, we have this a plus b times the square root of five. We have negative c square root of three uh, minus d times the square root of three times the square root of five for which you can put those together and just think of it as a square root of 15, like so. Um, how does, if this equals the original, the original number, a plus uh, b square root of five plus c times the square root of three plus this, uh, d times the square root of 15 here, you'll notice because of the difference of signs here that uh, since these things are linearly dependent, we have to have that c equals negative c, which implies that c equals zero. And so you see the same thing on the square root of 15 right here as well. Um, we get that c equals d equals zero if this is in fact a fixed element. Um, but with a, you just get a equals a. So a could be anything, b could be anything. Um, so I want us to note here that if we look at the subfield of E that is fixed by sigma, we get exactly F2. All right, so the way we've constructed this, sigma conjugates the square root of three, but it leaves the square root of five alone. Therefore, the fixed field is in fact going to be F2, which was Q adjoined the square root of five. All right, so that gives us one of the automorphisms 
in our Galois group. I want you to be aware that by a similar reasoning, we have some map tau, which is a map from E to E. Um, for what's it going to do? It's going to uh, it's going to send the square root of five to negative square root of five, like so. Um, and it's also going to leave uh, tau when you restrict it to F1. Now it's going to give you the identity in that situation, the identity on F1. Uh, and so in particular, if you take something like tau of A plus B times the square root of five plus C times the square root of three plus D times the square root of 15, like so, um, what this map is going to do, it's going to negate the square roots of 15. And so you end up with, in this situation, A minus B times the square root of five plus C times the square root of three. Now, as the square root of 15, um, it's the square root of five times the square root of three. So that square root of five gets replaced with a negative square root of five. So it also will conjugate the square root of 15, like so. Um, now, if this is a fixed element, uh, if this is a fixed element, make a comment there about that. If this is a fixed element, then this should equal a plus b times the square root of five plus c times the square root of three plus d times the square root of five, which of course, as these are different signs, they their coefficients would have to be zero. B and D are both zero. And so then you have no restriction on the choice for a coefficient A, no restriction on the coefficient for C. So in that situation, we see, in fact, that the fixed field associated to the subgroup of tau is going to be F1, which is Q adjoin uh, the square root of three. Again, just like with sigma here, notice that tau um, has order two as an automorphism. If you do it twice, uh, you get back you get back um, the, the identity right there. All right. So with that said, let's make a few other um, observations here. Let me move on to a new page here. So what do we know? So we have that the Galois group of E over Q. Um, it clearly it contains the identity. Um, it contains this element sigma. It contains tau as well. Um, I'm not sure I wrote them in the different order, right? Then there's potentially some other things going on inside of that. We'll come back to that in just a second. Um, I claim that we know the order of this Galois group. The order of the Galois group um, is, in fact, equal to, well, since it is a Galois, a Galois extension, this is going to equal E over Q, the degree of that extension. Well, how big is that? Um, picking one of your favorite of the intermediate fields, we'll take E over, say, F1 here, and then F1 over Q. Um, we can factor in that way because, like we already observed, um, these fields F1, F2 sit in the middle. So you have E, uh, it contains F1, it contains Q. We could also have done F2, wouldn't make much of a difference. Now, F1 here, of course, is Q adjoined the square root of 3. And the middle of a polynomial we mentioned was X squared minus 3. So this degree is 2 because the we adjoined a quadratic element to it. Now, I claim that when it comes to this one right here, this extension is the same thing as the degree of F2 over Q. And the reason I just I say that is because E in that situation, well, we'll leave that on the screen here. The reason I say we can do that is because in this situation, E is actually equal to um, the field extension F1 adjoin the square root of 5. We did it the other way around before, but this one's also true. Um, so E can be formed by extending F1 by adjoining the square root of 5. And the square root of 5 does still have as it's minimal polynomial x squared minus 5. It's minimal polynomial over q is x squared minus 5, which means that it's minimal polynomial over f1 has to divide x squared minus 5. Um, as this is a quadratic polynomial, um, if, it, if it factors at all, it has to split. And so that would mean that f1 contains the roots of x squared minus 5. That is, f1 would have to already contain the square root of 5 and or the negative square root of 5, which it doesn't have that. You can argue... Uh, that in fact, the that F1 does not contain any square roots of five whatsoever. So this is a proper extension. So it's going to have to be degree two as well for the same basic reasoning. And so when you put this together, the, the Galois extension has degree four, which means the Galois group has order four. Now, how many, Gal or how many groups have order four in general here, right? If we take our Galois group of E over Q, um, I'm going to call it just G for short. I hope that's Okay, right now. 
I'll do curly G right here. Um, there are basically two options. This group is either the cyclic group of order four or it's the Klein four group. Uh, that is Z2 cross Z2. So those two options. And so it turns out with the information I have already, I can determine which of these two groups we have. Uh, because notice, uh, clearly we have the identity, but our Galois group contains two automorphisms of order two. Uh, which of these groups can do that? Well, the Klein four group has three elements of order two, uh, but the cyclic group though has one unique element of order two. Uh, besides the identity, the other two elements of the cyclic group are elements of order four. Um, and so it turns out that our Galois group can't be cyclic because we have too many elements of order two. Uh, and as such, it turns out that this means that the Galois group has to be the Klein four group in this situation. Um, so ding, 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 ding. That's what we have here. Our Galois group is in fact equal to the Klein four group. Um, and that tells us that the fourth element we haven't accounted for yet has to be the product of the other two elements of order two. Um, so our Galois group is gonna be one, tau, sigma, and sigma tau. So what does sigma tau do though, right? Um, if we if we look at that, sigma tau or tau sigma, it turns out while functions in general don't commute, these ones will. Um, if I take an arbitrary element, a plus b root five plus c uh, root three plus d root 15, let's apply these two. Tau is going to conjugate the square root of five, thus also the square root of 15. So this is gonna give us um, a minus b root, 15, root five plus c root three minus d root 15 like so then what does what does sigma do in this situation sigma conjugates the square root of three um, for which in that situation then you're going to get a minus b root five sigma does nothing to that you're going to get negative c root three um, but then the square root of 15 will be conjugated again because again the square root of 15 is just the square root of five times the square root of three. Tau negated the square root of five. Sigma's gonna negate the square root of, uh, square root of three. And so when you do them together, um, you're going to actually do nothing to the square root of 15, right? Um, so notice that the elements that got their coefficients changed, um, the, the, the B is now a negative B and the C is now a negative C on the square root of five and the square root of three. Um, the square root of 15 actually was left uh, alone that has the original coefficient here. And so if this is supposed to be some fixed element, so this is what sigma does. Sigma will conjugate the square root of three and square root of five, but not conjugate the square root of 15. Tau, remember, conjugates the square root of five and square root of 15, and sigma conjugates the square root of three and the square root of 15. All right, so that's what's happening here. If this were a fixed element, this is supposed to equal a plus b root five plus c root three, plus d root 15. Well, like before, we see that you have to have b and c both equal zero, so they're gonna vanish. And so we see that the fixed field, the fixed field E sub, the subgroup generated by sigma tau here, this is going to fix the field Q adjoin the square root of 15. The square root of 15 is the thing fixed by this element, ah. And so we're gonna call this field F3. Uh, for the for the sake of discussion here. And so I want us then to see what are the the lattices that we have been constructed with regard to the Galois correspondence. Let me draw the fields over here. So our top field was Q adjoined the square root of three and the square root of five. There's the base field of Q. And then we've discovered there were three intermediate fields. We had Q join the square root of three, which we called F1. We have Q join the square root of five, which we call F2. And we just recently discovered there actually is a third field, which in hindsight makes total sense. We have Q join the square root of 15. And so then when we draw this picture, this picture looks exactly like the lattice for the Klein four group, for which just so we're aware, if we look at the Galois group of E over Q, that gives us the full Galois, uh, the full Galois group, which is V4 in that situation. Um, if we look at the Galois group of E over E, that'll just be the identity. Um, and so you get one right there. Um, and then we're going to have some intermediate fields uh, based upon fixed fields. There's the subgroup uh, sigma here. There's a subgroup generated by sigma. Um, there's the subgroup generated by tau. Remember that tau, the subgroup generated by tau 
actually fixes the square root of three. And the subgroup generated by sigma, it fixes uh, the square root of five. And then the subgroup generated by sigma tau, it, it fixes the um, the it fixes the square root of 15. And so we see this picture here as well. All right. Um, if I mentioned the degrees of these extensions, um, these are all degree two extensions. And we see the same correspondence happening over here. Um, we have two, 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 and two. And so we see this correspondence between the lattices. Now, this example can be a little bit deceptive uh, because the lattice for the Klein 4 group is the same top down versus bottom up. That is, if you flip the lattice upside down, you get the exact same picture. So it can give you this misconception that the correspondence looks like this. This field corresponds with this subgroup. And this field corresponds with this subgroup. The bottom coincides with the top and the top coincides with the bottom. So you do flip this thing upside down. Um, and so therefore this degree, this extension coincides with this one down here. You flip it upside down and this extension coincides with this extension right here. And lastly, this extension coincides with this one, but there's so much stinking symmetry happening right now. It can be a little bit deceptive. Now, this example, we worked with the square roots of 3 and the square roots of 5, uh, but there's nothing particularly special about those square roots. In fact, the example could have been done where you take the square root of some number p and the square root of some other number q, which basically we just require that p and q are not themselves perfect squares, and we require that the GCD between p and q is 1, uh, so we want them to be co-prime. For which, you know, this would work if P and Q are both prime numbers like 3 and 5. Um, and this actually gives us what we refer to as a bi-quadratic extension of the rational numbers. Um, and it turns out that with the right uh, with the right assumptions that the Galois group of a bi-quadratic extension of the rational numbers will always be the Klein 4 group. Um, if, you, if you kind of botch some of those assumptions I just mentioned, then you'll get a subgroup of the Klein 4 group, or I guess maybe it's a quotient group. Uh, but wh whichever one it is, it's, you we might get like a Z2 as your Galois group. Uh, and this is these are by quadratic extensions of the rational numbers. If you do other fields, you can get things similar to this. And so this is a very well understood and one of the simplest types of uh, Galois groups to study that are beyond just a simple um, a simple extension. You just throw on one square root. So this is a good example to get started with, despite the fact that one might be confused with the, the Galois correspondence because the lattices have symmetry from top to bottom there.